Assessment Application Assistance Webinar. The Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Grant, known as JMHPP for short, is a very important initiative to help reduce the prevalence of individuals with mental illness that are in our criminal justice system and to promote further collaboration between organizations in both the criminal justice and mental health system. My name is Nicola Smith-Key. I'm a senior policy analyst on our law enforcement program here at the Council of State Government Justice Center. I provide technical assistance to jurisdictions awarded a Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grant. This afternoon, we will give you a brief overview of the solicitation, discuss considerations for application involving a law enforcement component, provide an overview of what police mental health collaborations are, you will hear from a current JMHCP grantee, and we will provide you with a number of useful resources you can use as you prepare your application. Our presenters today will be Maria Fryer from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA for short, Jerry Murphy from the Council of State Government Justice Center, and representatives from the Rockingham Harrisonburg Mobile Crisis Unit, a FY15 JMHCP grantee. Those representatives are Kelly Royston, Cheryl Kreck, and Katrina Dido. There will be a question and answer session. To ask a question, please type the question into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. My colleague, Cynthia Kimmelman de Vries, will be assisting with that portion of the webinar. We will do our best to answer your questions. If your question does not get answered during the webinar, please follow up via email after the event has ended. At the end of the presentation, we will provide email addresses for everyone speaking today. If you encounter technical or audio problems during the webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866 229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording this event and will be emailing the recording to all attendees as well as posting it on our website. Last week, we hosted a general application assistance webinar where we review the requirements for the entire solicitation. On your screen, you can find a link to the recording of that webinar and a copy of the full slide presentation for download. Today, we focus our discussions mainly on the section of the solicitation that targets law enforcement strategies and initiatives. While we are happy to answer more general questions or any question today, we strongly encourage you to listen to and download the slides from the first webinar if you have not already done so. I would now like to take a moment to give you a, a brief overview of who we are here at the Council of State Government Justice Center. I will also provide you with a brief background and overview of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grant. Then I will turn the presentation over to Maria Fryer from BJA, who will provide more detailed information about the JMHCP grant and the focus on law enforcement programs and initiatives. The Council of State Government is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership association that investigates a host of different issues from transportation, education, healthcare, and the environment to criminal justice issues, 
which is handled by a division of the Council of State Government called the Justice Center. The Justice Center has a number of different divisions, including our Behavioral Health Division, which is focused on working around improving criminal justice and mental health responses to people with mental disorders that are engaged with the criminal justice system. This is where the technical assistance we provide grantees is housed. The law enforcement program under the Behavioral Health Division focuses on the role of law enforcement in the criminal justice system. Two key project areas are focused around, one, helping law enforcement agencies to develop or enhance their police mental health collaboration programs, PMHC for short, and two, engaging local law enforcement in efforts to improve reentry outcomes for individuals returning to their communities after incarceration. CSG Justice Center has been the sole technical assistance provider for the JMHCP grant since its inception in 2006. For more information about the technical assistance services that we provide, please view the first webinar recording which explains this in more detail. To learn more about what we do and the services we provide, please visit the web site at the link provided at the bottom of your slide. Through JMHCP, the Bureau of Justice Assistance has awarded 57 million in grants to more than 300 recipients in 49 states and territories. Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program funding has a long history of bipartisan support beginning in 2004. Most recently, in December 2016, the 21st Cures Act, a milestone bill to address mental illness and substance use disorders in criminal justice, amended and reauthorized the JNACP program. JMHCP supports innovative cross-system collaboration to improve responses and outcomes for individuals with mental illnesses or co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders who come in contact with the criminal justice system. BJA is seeking applications that demonstrate a collaborative project between criminal justice and mental health partners from eligible applicants to plan and implement justice and mental health strategies collectively designed between justice and mental health. The fiscal year 2017 solicitation can be accessed at the web address on your screen. At the end of the presentation, we will display all our contact information please feel free to email the appropriate person for additional information, either the BJA staff for more fiscal and grant-related management issues, or CSG Justice Center staff as it pertains to technical assistance issues. As a reminder, we will be emailing this webinar recording, including a link to the slides, as well as posting a link to the recording on our website on our webinar page in the archive form. Now I will turn things over to Maria Fryer from Bureau of Justice Assistance. Maria will provide us with a more detailed review of the JMATP FY17 solicitation and grant program and the categories that apply more to law enforcement applicants. Maria? Thank you, Nikki. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Law Enforcement Application Assistance Webinar. My name is Maria Fryer, and I'm a Policy Advisor at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I'm going to start by giving you a brief overview of who we are at the BJA, and then I will provide more detailed information on JMHCP grant categories. Our focus today will be on categories two and three. The Bureau of Justice Assistance oversees and manages the JMHCP program. The BJA mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development 
to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to achieve safer communities. Next slide. Category 1 Grant Track is a system-wide collaborative county approach focused on reducing the prevalence of individuals with mental disorders in local jails with funding amount of 200000 over a 24-month period. We will not be focusing on this grant track in today's webinar, but for more information, we encourage you to access the webinar that was hosted last week by the CSG Justice Center just by linking above to the link you see on your screen. Next slide. For the majority of this presentation, we will focus on Category 2 and 3. Category 2 is a strategic planning grant for law enforcement and mental health collaboration with a funding amount of $75,000 over a 12-month period. This should involve conducting a comprehensive agency assessment of policy and practice developing an agency training plan, building and maintaining a data collection system, and partnering with mental health in the community. Agencies will be provided practical and actionable written guidance drawn from the successful experiences of law enforcement to design their police mental health collaboration strategy. And we'll discuss more of that in detail shortly. Next slide. Category three, is an implementation and expansion grant with a funding amount of $300,000 for a project period of 24 months. Category 3 grantees will implement targeted mental health and justice systems interventions to address the needs of individuals with mental disorders. They will expand or enhance a well-established mental health and justice system collaboration program. Category 3 grantees will implement an already initiated plan or expand upon or improve upon a well-established collaboration plan between justice and mental health partners. Next slide. As was previously stated, the focus of this webinar is on the grant application for law enforcement focused grant tracks. Category 2 is only for law enforcement. And although Category 3 can fund a number of different expansion grants, our discussion on Category 3 will be tailored to law enforcement applicants. Category 2, the strategic planning for law enforcement and mental health collaboration is a new grant category. This will be available to a relatively large number of law enforcement agencies. There are are potential 40 grant awards for this category, and agencies will receive training and technical assistance to plan and design a police mental health collaboration program. Next slide. We will now go over some of the allowable costs for the Category 2 grant track. The coordinator can oversee the PMHC program. The coordinator can help guide you through the process of designing your PMHC to meet the needs of your community. The coordinator can access resources, make relevant links, review current related law enforcement policies, and assess community resources, which could play a role in building the program. Consultant services. This could be an expert in the field or someone from academia who can, who can and will be able to look at your program with an objective eye they will be able to help you determine performance measures, what data points you should be collecting, for example, call for service, use of force, or final dispositions. They can help you use data for strategic program planning for evaluation or making adjustments to policies. Evaluation. You may want to consider contracting out some duties for which you lack those skills in-house. For example, JMACP grantees often solicit the help and services of a local university to perform program evaluation or outcome evaluation or process evaluation. Next slide. Other allowable costs include meeting expenses related to planning. And finally, the grant can also be used for travel costs related to the planning of your grant initiative. You will be expected, for instance, to travel to the mandatory strategic planning session for this grant. 
Some JMHCP grantees have, in the past, used grant funds to connect with experts in the field. For example, the law enforcement mental health learning sites, which have been afforded national recognition due to their outstanding response to police encounters with people who have mental health needs. Law enforcement agencies from all over the country have been visiting the learning sites for a peer-to-peer -peer learning experience as they develop or enhance their PMHC program. To learn more about the learning site, please see the link on your screen or log on to the PMHC toolkit. Next slide. Category three is the implementation and expansion grant category. Law enforcement applicants must demonstrate in the narrative a written action plan describing areas needing improvement. For example, you can conduct a sequential intercept mapping, analyze data, and bring together a focus group to uncover the gaps in services for individuals with mental health needs who come in contact with law enforcement. An executed memorandum of understanding or other similar written agreement between law enforcement agency and one or more behavioral health partners. Because this is a collaboration, it is important to demonstrate commitment from both sides. A description of training curricula and in-service training regarding behavioral health. A letter of commitment of leadership from law enforcement agency or other local officials to carry out the plan. Next slide. It is important for applicants who are applying under Category 3 expansion to demonstrate in the narrative several things. For instance, how are you capturing the number of people with mental health or co-occurring disorders who are arrested? How are you tracking that data? How are you tracking final dispositions and when and where people are being diverted? Who is making the referrals and how are we capturing this information? Who is responsible for collecting the data and how it is being stored or shared between or among partners? Next slide. We will now discuss the allowable cost for Category 3 grant track. Developing engagement or receiving or diversion centers for individuals in custody of law enforcement. Engagement and receiving or diversion centers are designated locations for law enforcement to transport individuals to divert from arrest or the emergency room. For example, Bear County's Restoration Center is a comprehensive engagement center with an array of services for behavioral health populations, including two detox programs and an array of outpatient services. Osceola County Board of County Commissioners, as a part of their grant initiative, opened a triage center intended to offer law enforcement a meaningful alternative to arrest and incarceration when they encounter individuals who appear to be impacted by a behavioral health crisis. The triage center works in conjunction with their crisis intervention team training by providing officers with an additional resource in the community. You are also able to use funds for developing or enhancing an electronic information system. Information sharing between law enforcement and behavioral health is the key to success of a police mental health collaboration program and therefore having the appropriate tools, including computerized information systems is important. Funding can also be used to develop or expand a PMHC program such as a co-responder program or a crisis intervention team. The Boston Police Department used grant funds to increase staffing, which enabled the department to expand their co-responder model to another two districts. Delaware County Community Corrections was able to use funds to implement a crisis intervention team. Minnesota Department of Corrections used grant funds to implement CIT training for correctional officers and mental health and substance abuse treatment personnel in order to reduce the risk of offender and staff injury through reductions in use of force incidents. Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse used grant funds to train law enforcement officials in rural areas where staffing and financial constraints inhibit agencies from sending officers to training. And last but not least, the funds can be used 
to conduct evaluation of an existing PMHC program. For example, Johnson County, Kansas worked collaboratively with Dr. Alex Halsinger from the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Missouri, Kansas City to do an evaluation of the Overland Park Police Department's mental health co-responder project. So with that, I will now hand it over to Jerry Murphy, Director of Law Enforcement at the CSG Justice Center to provide an overview of the Police Mental Health Collaboration Program. Jerry? Thank you, Maria, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, as Maria said, I'll just spend a couple of minutes uh, reviewing uh, what we mean when we talk about a police mental health collaboration. Uh, and as it says, you'll see here on the next slide, uh, please, that uh, we have a, just a brief definition of a police mental health collaboration program. And it really is just that. It, it's a collaborative program that includes both a law enforcement agency and a behavioral health provider that serve as equal partners uh, on the team. The, the intention or the purpose of the PMHCs is designed to uh, respond to individuals uh, who may have behavioral health needs or who may be experiencing a behavioral health crisis uh, to identify these individuals uh, and to uh, determine the most appropriate disposition uh, for these individuals given um, circumstances of the call. Uh, and in many, many situations, there are opportunities to divert uh, these individuals from both the criminal justice system and from hospital emergency rooms. And so there should be a strong focus on diversion within your program. And the third part of the program, too, that we just don't have listed here, but it's very important, is to have um, the support and buy-in of local government representatives, whether that be, uh, you know, in, in your city, uh, your mayor, uh, on a, in a county level, your county executive or city council or county council, uh, but because these programs cross over uh, a couple of different uh, service providers in the community, it, it's vitally important that there be support at the highest levels within your community. Next slide, please. There are really five common types of police mental health collaboration programs, and I'll run through them quickly. Next slide. The crisis intervention team uh, model is probably the most well-known. I'm sure many of you might be familiar with that. It's often referred to as CIT. Uh, it's based on the Memphis model, uh, which is the Memphis Police Department, where CIT uh, was started um, at this point uh, almost about 20 years ago. Uh, it, it includes a process of addressing system-wide change. Again, going back to what we emphasize in a police mental health collaboration program, that it includes uh, all of the key partner agencies and stakeholders in the community. The CIT approach um, consists of identifying uh, officers, and it's usually more um, seasoned officers rather than those just coming out of of the recruit level academy, but more seasoned officers uh, who agree or volunteer uh, to be in the CIT program. Uh, and then they then undergo a 40-hour uh, CIT training curriculum. In Memphis, they try to keep uh, the number of CIT officers uh, roughly between 20 and 25 percent of the patrol force. And the idea is that these qualified officers uh, will arrive on scene. Uh, sometimes they can be dispatched immediately to a call, but in many situations they will arrive on a scene after the initial responding patrol officer has arrived and made an assessment that a CIT officer uh, may be uh, helpful in resolving the call and reaching the most appropriate disposition. So that is a, sort of very quickly the CIT model. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second model that we're highlighting is the co-responder team, uh, and this is a team of both a specially trained officer and a mental health crisis worker uh, that respond together uh, to behavioral health calls for service. 
Uh, in some communities, they are dispatched directly by the 911 center. Uh, in other communities, they either uh, monitor radio traffic or they respond to requests by uh, the initial responding officer uh, to come to the scene and uh, provide uh, assistance to the officer. And by drawing upon the combined experiences of both the officer and the mental health professional, uh, these co-responder teams are able to link people with mental illnesses to the appropriate services or provide other efficient and appropriate responses, uh, in particular, again, with a, a strong focus on trying to divert individuals uh, that don't belong in the criminal justice system or who can be diverted uh, from hospital emergency rooms. Next slide, please. Uh, the third uh, type of PMHC program is a mobile crisis team, uh, and this is a team of uh, mental health or behavioral health professionals. Uh, they usually do not include uh, law enforcement officers, but they are available, again, at the request of officers uh, to uh, travel to the scene of a call um, to assist them. And similar to the co-responder team, uh, they might be dispatched by the 911 center. Um, in a number of communities, they also uh, respond to calls that come into, say, a dedicated um, mental health or uh, suicide hotline so that they can be sort of dispatched by both 911 center and a mental health provider. And their goal is to help stabilize the encounters and, when appropriate, uh, assume responsibility for uh, connecting the individual to mental health services. Next slide, please. Uh, the fourth approach, and this is one that we are seeing more and more across the country, is a case management uh, team. And in the case management team approach, this is one in which um, officers, oftentimes in collaboration with a mental health or other behavioral health professional, um, carry a caseload of consumers. Uh, they engage these individuals uh, who most often um, have contacts with uh, individuals, have repeated contacts, I'm sorry, with law enforcement agencies. These sometimes are referred to as, as chronic consumers. And in many of these um, models, uh, these individuals who do have repeated contact with law enforcement agree to uh, participate uh, in the program and that they uh, will welcome uh, the case management teams uh, to help them uh, you know, develop solutions uh, to those individuals' specific needs. Again, with the goal of being trying to uh, reduce the number of uh, repeat interactions. Uh, the approach uh, is not one in which officers are turned into mental health clinicians. Um, and that's why they're often done as a team. So again, you draw on the experience of both the officer and a qualified mental health clinician. But it's to help these individuals, again, stay connected to mental health services and community resources, make sure they're adhering to treatment plans and, and medication regimens, and are fulfilling other responsibilities such as school, work, and training. Uh, these individuals uh, may be contacted in some communities uh, you know, on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, in some places it, it could be a, a daily basis. Um, and again, that is something that is sort of worked out uh, between the case management teams and the consumers, again, with the primary goal being to keep individuals connected to the services they need uh, to avoid the repeated contacts uh, with law enforcement agencies. I said uh, the, the goal of this is not to turn officers into clinicians, but we actually do have examples of a couple of departments uh, that have officers with uh, extensive experience and in, indeed uh, in some communities uh, these officers uh, uh, have master's degrees in social work and may even be licensed social workers in those particular communities. For example, the Palm Beach County Sheriff, which is a former JMHCP grantee, um, maintains a unit that includes uh, about 10 officers who are uh, licensed as social workers in the state of Florida. Um, they work with other behavioral health clinicians to provide these services. Uh, next slide, please. 
And the final approach is what we call a tailored approach. Uh, and this is uh, really uh, based on agencies making the, ter the determination um, based on their resources and the needs of the particular community to um, sort of draw from the four preceding examples um, and develop a tailored or custom approach uh, that fits their needs. It really begins with the premise that you know, every patrol officer um, is able to uh, handle a behavioral health call or service from the initial contact to the final disposition. But this might include um, identifying uh, officers uh, who perhaps take on additional responsibilities in terms of a proactive or follow-up work. Uh, there might be other responsibilities or duties, such as um, maintaining liaison with behavioral health providers, um, uh, delivering presentations to the community, assisting with uh, training, uh, you know, either the recruit or the in-service le uh, level, um, and to help a department uh, provide a, a sort of a full, comprehensive system level approach to managing behavioral health calls for service. As agencies get involved in um, looking at the, uh, the number of behavioral health calls for service that they are responding to, um, they oftentimes realize that while they do need those services at that initial crisis uh, level to handle that call for service, that there are, again, a variety of uh, duties and responsibilities and tasks that can occur before that call or after that call that will allow the agency to get a better sense of managing the challenge that they're facing. Next slide, please. So as I said, that's a quick run through of the five approaches. Um, we will uh, reference uh, at the end of the webinar some resources that you can go to, uh, including the Police Mental Health Collaboration Toolkit, an online toolkit where you can learn more about those particular examples and see um, some examples from specific agencies. And you'll see here that uh, we have uh, the list of the law enforcement grantees that we are working with currently over the previous three years. Um, it represents 19 states here. Uh, it represents departments that um, serve urban communities, suburban communities, rural, and some that are even statewide. And you will also see that there is a tremendous range here in the size and function of the law enforcement agencies. Uh, we have uh, one agency as small as 20 officers, and we have another agency here um, as large as 5,400 officers. Uh, this includes both uh, city police departments and county sheriffs as well. Next slide, please. And here we just have a quick run through of uh, some of the programs that these individual uh, grantees are working on. These are the titles that they are using for their program. Um, but you will see that uh, all of them, uh, with uh, I guess the exception of the mental health court, uh, fall into the category of the five types of police mental health collaboration programs uh, we just talked about. Next slide, please. So at this point, what we would like to do is uh, give you the opportunity to hear from a current a JMHCP grantee. Uh, this is the Rockingham Harrisonburg, Virginia uh, Mobile Crisis Unit. And I'm going to uh, turn the uh, presentation over to three presenters um, from Rockingham, Harrisonburg. Uh, the first will be Kelly Royston, who's the Rockingham Harrisonburg Crisis Intervention Team Coordinator. Uh, we also have Cheryl Kreck, who's a retired captain from the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office, and Katrina Dito, who's a licensed clinical social worker uh, with the Harrisonburg Rockingham Community Services Board. So we'll turn it over to uh, Rockingham County right now. Thank you. We want to. We want to start out with some program goals that we set out during this initial. Um, grant uh, application that we did. 
Um, the first one is we've continued an established partnership with a mental health and law enforcement organization. Number two is appropriately divert persons requiring immediate psychiatric interventions prior to entering the criminal justice system. Number three was connect frequent mental health consumers to resources within the mental health system. Number four was follow up with high risk individuals that have been determined as having a mental illness and have been released from the criminal justice system. Number five was to reduce law enforcement time on calls associated with mental health consumers. And number six was to expand the hours of our mobile crisis unit to cover Monday through Friday from eight to four. We currently do that two days a week now from um, eight to four as well. Um, so that is our ultimate goal at the end is to have a full time crew. All right, next slide here. Okay, so our program components and features at this time is a certified law enforcement officer is teamed up with a licensed mental health clinician at the jail, and we have that right outside of booking, in order to expedite the assessment of a serious mental illness of a person in custody. So if they come into the booking area, they are right there at the door. We don't have to wait for nobody to come in. The MCU works with both the booking sergeant and the magistrate to determine options during the process of charges and final deposition. Referrals to an inpatient care and community or jail resources occur at this time of final deposition. The MCU follows up with individuals that have been released from the jail and have been determined as having a mental illness that places them at a high risk for future criminal justice involvement. The MCU follows up with members to the community that have been identified as possible needing immediate mental health services. Okay, so our program challenges that we've come up to this current day is a new program in the community, um, Uncharted Territory. Didn't quite know where to go with this. Understanding and learning what the MCU can do in order to effectively resolve situations. Educating the jail staff and the community services board as to what we can do to help resolve situations within the jail and the community, learning to fill service treatment gaps without duplicating existing services, finding creative responses to existing service gaps, and learning to prioritize responses due to time constraints part-time program. We want to just our program accomplishments, and that's also probably where our Law enforcement and mental clinician will come in too as well And this. They've been able to find balance between serving the needs of the jail and the needs of the community, eliminating downtime for the unit. Go ahead, and Cheryl wants to speak about this. So our, our grant initially was written primarily for the jail uh, to deal with individuals that were coming in in crisis, but from the, 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 the time that the grant was submitted, and the time it was approved and we came on board, we had a well-established CIT program, and therefore we were finding that there weren't a lot of individuals that were being brought into the jail that were in crisis because the law enforcement officers understood that they needed to go to the hospital. So with that being said, we had a lot of downtime and we felt that we needed to find other initiatives to take up some take up some of that downtime so that we were doing what we were supposed to do, and that's to help those individuals with mental illness. Thank you, Cheryl. Also, we're able to connect individuals to valuable services, local community connections, and mental health care that prevents reincarceration and rehospitalization. And Katrina has something she would like to say about this. Yeah, I'm just going to, um, it seems that typically we want to work within the law enforcement or the mental health systems, but we, what we have found because of the, um, the, the ability to, to, because of the ability to tailor what we need to this program, we've been able to also pull in community connections, community people who are interested in helping people with mental illness, um, community organizations, churches, that kind of thing. Um, so we've been able to be a little bit more creative and work outside of, 
um, just the justice system and the mental health system. All right, thank you, Katrina. Doing community outreach to other services, organizations, and nonprofits, educating them as to how we may be able to assist them is also another accomplishment that we have found. What we have learned in the last several months is it is imperative to meet with other organizations with some similar programs in order to develop a successful program for our community. And Cheryl has some things she'd like to say about that. So through, through these grants, uh, I can assure you, you have plenty of paperwork that will give you all the pieces that you need to create a successful program. Uh, where we found the problem was that although we had all the pieces, we weren't quite sure how to put it together. And we resolved those issues by meeting with other aid agencies that had similar programs to what we wanted to do. And it just was a huge help. Thank you, Cheryl. The MCU has helped to establish a stronger working relationship between law enforcement and the Community Services Board. Mental health consumers seem to not favor law enforcement officers. The MCU combated this challenge by dressing the law enforcement officers in a soft uniform, such as BTUs, CIT polo shirt, duty belt, and neutral jacket, and by driving in an unmarked vehicle. And I will tell you they are more receptive to Cheryl and Katrina that way than any other um, than a police car with blue lights or a uniform. So that's been a strong point for us. It is important to collect data and develop a way to use this data to, de to stem sorry, demonstrate the success of the program. And Cheryl would like to say something about that. So we've developed a lot of forms to go with our program and we've done an excellent job at collecting the data. Uh, we are still a young program. We've really only been up and running since the end of July but we're still searching for a good way to use that data to show that the program is successful. If you talk to other law enforcement agencies, if you talk to members from the Community Services Board, if you talk to leaders from some of the nonprofits, everybody believes it's a good program and it's a successful program, but we need to take the data that we're collecting and show that it's a successful program, and that's what we're still working on at this point. And I will tell you, I go over and talk to Cheryl Katrina about every day they work, and we're always doing something with data. So it's, it's, an, it's a continuous process of the program. And I think that's all we have. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Kelly, Cheryl, and Katrina for that very informative presentation. And thank you for putting in a plug for the importance of data and what that can do for a program. Appreciate it. So now I'll just talk about a few resources that um, you will find handy as you prepare your application for the JMHCP solicitation. There are a number of additional resources that you might find helpful as you prepare for your application. The solicitation can be found at the first link at the top of this slide. A link to the first webinar that we conducted on the solicitation last week can be found on the JC site here. Not mentioned today, but discussed in the first webinar is the Planning and Implementation Guide, a requirement for all grantees to complete once they receive an award. If you follow the third link on the screen, you will find a specialized law enforcement planning and implementation guide. This is an excellent resource for you to consult as you plan and outline the implementation of your initiatives. This guide is not necessary to complete now and will be a project that you will undergo with your technical assistance provider once you receive an award. The next link, next slide please. The next link is, is general information about the JMACP grant program that you can find on the BJA website. As you prepare your budget, everyone should be aware of the OCFO customer service hotline, which will be able to answer any budget questions you have to ensure that you are meeting all the financial requirements as set forth by the solicitation materials. And we really encourage if you're applying for this grant, please 
please be sure to reach out to OTFO customer service. BJA has a grant writing manual as well that is also a great reference as you prepare your application. For more information about the CSG Justice Center, please visit us at csgjusticecenter.org. In October 2016, BJA launched the PMHC Toolkit, which is an online compendium of best practices and resources to help law enforcement agencies partner with mental health providers to respond appropriately and safely to people with mental illnesses. We encourage you to visit this site as well. Should you need should you run far into difficulties with submitting your application, please reach out to the National Criminal Justice Referral Services, who will be able to answer many questions about the solicitation. They are open from 10 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday to Friday, and 10 to 8 on the day of the, solic the solicitation closes. You can contact them via phone, email, or live chat at the information on your screen. You can also find this contact information in the solicitation on page two. The number for the NCJRS is 301-240-7649. That's 301-240-7649. At any time, you can also reach out to either BJA or the CSG Justice Center and we will leave our information up on screen for your reference. Next slide, please. I will now open up for questions from the field. My colleague, Cynthia Kimmelman Debris, sorry, will be facilitating this section. Next slide. Hey, Nikki, thank you so much. Um, my name is Cynthia Kimmel-Mendefrace, and I'm a, a Deputy Program Director here at the Justice Center. We're now going to begin the question and answer session of the webinar. <clears throat> to ask a question, please type the question into the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. I will be monitoring the Q&A from all the participants, and we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the time remaining. Again, if we run out of time, please do email one of us using the information that's provided on your screen. Okay, um, and Olivia, if you can change the slide to our Q&A, that would be great. To our contact information, that would be great. Um, we have a ton of questions that are coming in really quickly. Um, I suspect that we might not be able to get to all of them. Um, so once again, please do go ahead and email. Um, if it's a more general question about um, the solicitation, somebody at BJA, specifically Maria Fryer, on the left-hand side of your screen, um, or anybody on the law enforcement team in the Justice Center can answer your questions so, as well. That includes myself, Jerry, Nikki, or Talia. Okie doke. Give me one second. Okay. Um, this is probably a question for Maria um, and Jerry. This is a great question. Um, and I think, Maria, you might want to take a stab at this. It's, it's a, the distinction between Category 2 and the county grants. Is, um, is Category 2 the only option if funds needed to improve jails, mental health data collection systems to help better track prevalence of individuals with mental health in jail um, and those in contact with mm -hmm. LE? Or could Category 1 allow this as well? Um, okay, so Category 1 really focuses on data collection and system analysis um, at the county level, county system, county system analysis, where Category 2 is really focused on law enforcement response. Um, so Category 1, again, is more about planning, um, and I would just, you know, suggest Reading through again, um, I hope that I have covered that. Um, it's, I hope that covered the question. Great, Maria. Um, and um, we had received a question from someone that was interested in finding out specifically the types of programs 
that are being in, implemented in the specific prison for men? Um, and I think that's a really great question. Um, unfortunately, we don't have access to that information, but there is a host of information on our website in terms of model programs. Um, as well as um, a really great site that's the National Criminal Justice um, Initiatives Resource Map. Um, I just put a link to it in the chat box on your screen. Um, you can find that on the CSG Justice Center website. Um, if you go under um, the reentry page, under resources, you will think, see a link for it. Um, and what's great about that is that you can actually sort through all of the programs that the Department of Justice has funded um, under the Bureau of Justice Assistance and under JMHCP, as well as our sister grant, the Second Chance Act grant program. Um, so if you follow that link, there's a filter box at the bottom of the page. If you click on U.S. Department of Justice and BJA, it will give you a filter for JMHCP that you can select. And then you can take a look at your state in particular and see what's been funded there. Okay, um, so we've got a few questions that are similar to this. So does the applying agency have to be a law enforcement agency or can it be a mental health agency? Um, and I'm thinking, Maria, do you want to take a stab at that one? Yes, sure. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, okay, so it is a collaboration program between uh, the justice system and mental health. Um, however, the eligibility is, is state, local, or tribal um, entities. So law enforcement fall under local government, and the mental health authority can also apply. Um, they do need to be the mental health authority uh, for, for the state, local, or um, local community or tribal community. Um, so, so that both can apply, yes. Fabulous. Okay. Um, category two seems to include options to also evaluate existing police mental health collaboration programs. Would Category 2 be the best choice if you currently don't have the capacity to truly capture data required for the Category 3 application narrative? I'm, I'm trying to grasp at the question one more time. I'm sorry. Cynthia. I mean, one more time. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, category 2 seems to include an option to also evaluate existing police mental health collaboration programs. I think that part, Jerry, right. also um, you might want to address. Um, would Category 2 be the best choice if the jurisdiction doesn't have the capacity to um, capture the data required in a Category 3 narrative? Um, and I think that um, the amount of data required in the Category 3 narrative might be something to address. So um, there are, you know, certain things that you've got to cover in the narrative to to really be to be appropriate for category three. You, you've got to establish that you you've got uh, a program that's that's up and running, and part of that is um, to be able to collect data. Um, the category two, even though you can have an evaluation component of category two, it's it's primarily geared towards strategizing a response. Jerry, yeah, Jerry just, you add? Uh, yeah. yeah, just to add to that, I think also in Category 2 it talks about um, being able to um, uh, collect and analyze data uh, around your behavioral health calls for service in your community. So that is clearly something that we see, you know, as an outcome. Um, for those grantees in Category 2. Um, and so, you know, the Category 2 grantees, um, you know, it's focused on um, communities that um, maybe they have a couple of pieces of, of a program in place, but it's not a comprehensive program and they're trying to get there, or obviously for places that um, are just starting out, you know, they don't have anything in place, uh, they would like to do that. So. I would also suggest if you go to the PMHC toolkit, um, you will see that there are 10 essential elements of a police mental health collaboration program. And I, I would use that as a little bit of a scorecard for you to determine what might be the most appropriate category. Um, you know, if you take a look at those 10 essential elements and you say, boy, we really only have two of these, and we'd like to try to figure out how to get the remaining eight, then I would take take a look at the Category 2 
um, grants because that's going to help you uh, get, uh, you know, a, a program that is just starting out um, or maybe it's struggling to, to get some traction. Um, the Category 2 grantee uh, might be the um, grant might be the right place to, to look. Um, and I would say that um, I have this sneaking suspicion or gut feeling that part of this is also about how much data has to be collected as a Category 3 grant. Um, and if that is the direction of the question, please do go ahead and email Maria, Jerry, myself, um, Nikki, or Talia, um, because we can walk through a little bit um, just how detailed that needs to, to get in the Category 3 grants. Um, I don't think that the expectation is that you are creating a brand new data collection system necessarily versus a lighter level amount of data collection um, that you're looking at. Um, so um, please do feel free to follow up with that. It's still confusing. Um, okay, planning and implementation guides. Um, does the P&I guide have to be done prior to submitting the application? And was it an omission for Category 2 grantees? Is it a requirement for Category 2? Maria? Cynthia, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, um, and Nikki, you can take a step at this, too. That's fine. Um, is um, the planning and implementation guide a requirement for Category 2 grantees, um, or was that an omission in the solicitation? And is it required to be done prior to submitting an application? Required? However, you, you do not need to submit a planning and implementation guide prior um, to being awarded. And that's something that you, it's an exercise that you would conduct with your training and technical assistance provider. Um, and it's part of planning and actually creating the very beginnings of how, how you're going to put together your, your program and actually implement it. All right, Great. thank you. And, and, also, and, and for the Category 2 grantees, um, we are um, working with BJA to develop a um, document that will be um, essentially serve as the planning document for those Category 2 grantees. Uh, and it, it is referenced in the uh, solicitation that, um, that, that this is going to be somewhat of a roadmap document that's going to help you get from the very early stages uh, to having a comprehensive program by the end of the grant period. Great. Um, so at this point, just to, to summarize it, Category 2 right now doesn't actually require a P&I guide. Um, is a Category 2 program grant acquired before receiving a Category 3 award? Maria, do you want to take a step at that? Yeah. Or Jerry? Okay. Sure. Sorry. The, so I'm thankful that you corrected. Is it cat, is it, yeah, yeah is it category three? Yeah. This yeah. is category three. Category three does require a planning and implementation guide. Yes. No, I'm sorry. Let me, let's go back. Is a category two grant being funded under category two a requirement before applying to and receiving a category three award? No. Oh, no. Um, no. Uh, they don't. Category 1, 2, and 3 are not in any specific order, and they are not prerequisite to applying to a different category. They are all independent. Okay, great. Um, and um, is it only law enforcement that can apply for Category 3? Which the answer to that is no. Today we've just covered some of the different allowable uses that can be under Category 3 um, that are under that are connected to law enforcement. The previous webinar that we had conducted last week um, reviews all of the different allowable uses and categories that can be funded under Category 3. Um, and I think we have time um, for just one more question. I know that there are a few that we have not gotten to, so please do go ahead and email us at one of the um, email addresses on the screen. Um, can the funds be used to enhance a current CIP program, such as to add nursing staff or doctor services? Yes, that, that's allowable. Okay. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a great, great use in Category 3. If you had 
uh, an existing program and you want to uh, somehow enhance or expand that program, um, and in this case, you know, adding um, uh, medical um, staff to the program uh, is, is a great use of those funds. Maybe you have a mobile crisis team and it only operates on the daylight shift and you want to expand to the evening or overnight shift, that, that would be a great example of, of a Category 3 approach. Okay. And um, Nikki, I know you told me one more question. I just want to ask this one really quickly. I think this has, a, has broad implication. It's a very fast answer. Um, is it the attempt that the proposed um, that the proposal fund one law enforcement agency um, and mental health, or could it be a consortium of several small law enforcement agencies in a specific mm -hmm. region? Yes, yeah. uh, a consortium or, or taking a regional approach is, is fine. Okay, great. Nikki, I'm going to turn it back over to you now. Thank you, Cynthia, Maria, and Jerry for responding to those questions. As Cynthia mentioned, if your question wasn't answered, please go ahead and email us and we will get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you all for attendance and participation and thank you to our presenters. We're very much looking forward to working with all of you. This concludes the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program 2017 Grant Application Webinar for Law Enforcement Applicants. As you exit this webinar, a short survey will automatically appear to ask about your experience on the webinar. We are required to report on participa participant responses to this sort of programming and very much appreciate your taking a couple of seconds to complete the questions that will appear. We will email you a recording of this presentation after the event, and the recording will also be available online in a few days on our website. Again, thank you for your time and have a good day.